Yeah, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and kick us off live here. And I have like a button that I'm pressing too, which sends out a tweet. And I'm like so excited about okay. that. <laughs> but okay. All right. So uh, I'll, I'll use the English pronunciation because I am unreliable at best at the German yeah. pronunciation. But <laughs> I appreciate it. No worries. So, and I think with that, uh, I think we might be live. So okay. I'd like to welcome everyone to the live stream. Thank you for being here. And today um, I'm joined by Simon Wondracek. And Simon has uh, come to me with like a question. And it's like a really interesting question. Like, let's talk about sustainable business models. And uh, as I was just filling him in a couple minutes ago, I know nothing about business models. But I think we could have a really interesting conversation over a map. So we've put together some things. We're going to do some exploring. Um, yeah, Simon, welcome. And thanks for being here. Thanks for having me here, Ben. Yeah, so so kind of like get us started. What? Why do you care about sustainable business models? Like what, what is in your mind important enough to warrant this kind of exploration? Mm. Well, to go a little bit back, I figured out for myself that um, if I put a lot of time in my work, I want to do something which is kind of meaningful, um, where I create an impact for what I do, but also whoever I'm helping with also uh, is creating an impact. And uh, I mean, one of the bigger, the biggest challenges we are facing right now is the climate change, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to help people let's say, make the world a little bit better regarding our um, challenge here. And um, well, I'm, I'm not that experienced, or not, I'm not an expert on, on climate change um, or on the details here, but what I do have is a lot of experience with business models. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, it might be nice to try to get my expertise into that field so um, I can help people who are interested in uh, changing their business model to a more sustainable one. Yeah, and get them to to start it, uh, get them started with that. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, and as we go along, um, I, my uh, my awesome, amazing admin is also on the call. His name's Tyler, uh, and I'm gonna be calling out moments where there he is, Hi. Tyler. Where, where where I feel like something really important was said, um, and I'm gonna say, "Hey, Tyler, grab that." Um, so <laughs> that introduction from Simon was was fabulous because I think it it. Uh, so Tyler, grab that, <laughs> uh, because like I, there's there's so much there. Like there's, we're not all going to be the perfect experts, to like the perfect puzzle piece to fit into some sort of like problem puzzle. Because life doesn't work that way. Life is messier, and we all have what we have, and we can offer what we can offer. So, I I really like appreciate you. The way that you're framing that because i think it's a it, there's a view of things that says you know i can't contribute because i don't have this expertise uh and that is a is a pretty like action diminishing like you're not going to do anything you're not going to, to actually do anything whereas like people who do have strange kind of backgrounds or different backgrounds that aren't necessarily what people think are needed um, but that you can go off and explore in a direction and find something that maybe they won't find. Uh, I think I think being willing to say, hey, I don't have what I expect is perfectly needed, but I have something else, and I, I feel like there's maybe a way that could contribute. So that using that as the basis for an inspiration for exploring topics like climate change, I think is really important, especially because what we're doing right now is not working in... I mean, it's working in the sense that it is producing the outcomes that it is producing, but it, it is not working. It has a timer. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not sure that it would be uh, sustainable. Um, yeah, definitely. It won't be sustainable. So, I mean, I mean, currently we are talking a lot about the uh, CO2 um, issue we have and the atmosphere mm -hmm. and how um, the world is getting warmer and warmer. But on the other hand, um, there are also other topics like, for example, how much resources and materials we still have left mm -hmm. and i mean we always think about okay we have enough stuff here on 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 our earth to sustain us but i mean in the end it's a finite world and finite resources so we have to think about that and um 
to me, it's not only a question, or let's say to me and my clients, I think it's not only a question about any morals. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it is a moral subject as well, if you think about the different generations. But on the other hand, it's also an, an uh, economic uh, question. So I think as a business, I need to consider the scarcity of resources. I need to um, consider the change of the customer needs and preferences in order to uh, exist as a company in, uh, in the future. So mm. I think it's important either way. This is, this is really great because I think um, this is going to get us set up to, to dive into some really interesting questions. And I, I think I think we'll take a look at some of the maps that you've been playing with. I, I think you've at least got some value chains figured out. Um, yeah. You also had some systems diagrams, I think, that you used to sort of yeah. inspire those value chains. And we're going to get to those, I think. but. There's something, there's something about what you just said, and, and I'm just making note of this in the mirror board that we're in. Um, sustainable business models, kind of like the inspiration here, talking about like zeroing in on the finitude, like the, the, the limitedness of the resources that we have. Before the we kicked off, we were talking about copper, we were talking about lumber, we were talking about things that kind of we take for granted. And our production of products and things is near limitless it's like it's 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 done under the assumption that we will never run out and mm -hmm. or rather i guess like the the changes in paradigms for how we think about when to produce something only happens when we start hitting that like that threshold where we notice that we're running yeah. out and how long does like how much is left whenever we <laughs> we hit that threshold is an interesting question yeah, I think as a, as, a, as humans, we kind of have a tendency to just um, think about the near future and um, having a look at, uh, let's say, a little bit into the future is kind of hard for us and makes us, yeah, kind of the decisions to 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 make to to, to do decisions today that uh, affect us in the long run is kind yeah. of hard to do um, in the systems we are working. Yeah, I mean, even like I have that conversation pretty frequently. And I also struggle <laughs> with, with with making decisions that are like actually like suited to a longer time span. And I, I just do not, it's hard. It takes practice and like, Definitely. like we don't have many opportunities to practice. Um, so, well, I, I should say the structures and the environment that we have right now uh, doesn't necessarily support us practicing that. Um, so that's an interesting question about how that might change. But the, the impact I think that you're seeing is that there are changes in customer needs and preferences that are occurring. And would it be fair to say that that represents an opportunity? Definitely. <laughs> okay. That's what I'm really, really convinced about. Okay, so, so tell me a little bit about why that's exciting. Mm, I think uh, people will recognize the issues uh, we uh, face about climate change. And I think the last couple of years kind of demonstrated uh, that, uh, at least in Germany, but I think in the US uh, as well. And uh, this changes, uh, I think, the attitude of customer, but uh, this also changes the uh, constraints we have. Let's say, for example, some resources uh, getting um, uh, more expensive, but also the regulators, the politics uh, uh, will kind of get into that. and. For example, in the, in, in, uh, in the European Union, we have those certificates for CO2. Um, so producing a lot of or using a lot of CO2 gets more and more expensive. So you have to think about how to reduce your uh, CO2 output. And of course, every production kind of uses that to mm -hmm. some degree. And um, so I think from both sides, from the, from the customer side, but also from the regulator side, there will be a lot of challenges coming to uh, businesses and they need to anticipate that and they need to change their uh, value change uh, to that. And that's not something you can do just in a few days or weeks or right. a month. So I think it's now is a good point to start with that. Excellent, yeah. And, and Tyler, uh, that whole section leading up to like the shift in the changes in, in customer needs and preferences all the way through what Simon just explained. Such a good setup. Um, because I think you're like, you're, you're dead on like there. Trans so, so transformation is always something that like I end up having opinions about. <laughs> and um, 
so there, like Andrew Clay Schaefer has some talks on, uh, there's one called Teaching Old DevOps New Tricks. And the thrust of the talk is basically like you think that this is a light bulb, like light switch moment whenever you're trying to go from old paradigm to new paradigm, when in fact you're dealing with something that requires much more incremental every day, 1% better, just making one better decision than you did yesterday, slowly, slow building, like trying to basically save money and then let the interest kind of pay off. And in, in that sense, that reminds me of this quote down here from uh, Cameron Tonkin-Wise. So Cameron um, and, and some of the people who are watching may know also Jay Bloom. Uh, Jabe is a mentor of mine, and he and Cameron um, were doing uh, studying and teaching at the School of Transition Design at CMU. And Cameron like points this out. Like a lot of times, these these transitions are from one system, one composition, to another system and another composition, and it's usually in response to something like a situation that we deem problematic, um, and. So part of what Jabe has been going on about lately is like noticing. How do we help people notice things? Because like learning can't happen until you see the thing that is happening. And that leads me to this image, this uh, <laughs> very involved image. This is this is something from, um, a, I guess, a, like a theory slash framework called Multilevel Perspective by Frank W. Hales. And there's a book called uh, Technological Transitions and Systems Innovation, I think is what that is. Um, really interesting book. Uh, but basically what it describes is stabilities and the ways that those stabilities fall apart. And then the ways that those new stabilities emerge afterwards. And kind of like just to sort of give you a likely story, Imagine like a landscape, basically what he says is like there, there's like a landscape force uh, in some cases, like just an external factor that nobody really was paying attention to, or if they were paying attention, they ignored it, or there's nothing they could do about it. And something like climate change represents, I think, a good example of a landscape force. But you could also talk about things like regulatory changes that were unanticipated, or I don't know, like a an upset election or something like that external factors that make the existing stability. And so what Kales talks about is like the socio-technical regime and it's composed of, you know, all sorts of things like mark, like user preferences, like you were describing, um, the industries that exist, the policies, the technology, like, like all of that stuff that's interacting, including with like culture and breakthroughs and science and things like that to, to keep things there. Like it's, mm -hmm. it, all the networks of vendors, all the like um, policy makers, lobbyists, everything like that comes together to sort of keep things in this stability. And for example, we're, we're probably seeing this to some extent with the move to electric vehicles, EVs from uh, like there's Toyota has been in the news lately, I think mm -hmm. something about that. So like th there's like that stability, it's a stable configuration. And imagine if, for example, talking about scarce resources, imagine if all of our oil supply like was suddenly threatened in a very serious and real way, just hypothetical. So that might be an example of a landscape force and that comes out of nowhere and basically breaks up this stability. And all of a sudden there's a constraint. And so the way that we use that resource has to change. And it's almost like um, if you're sitting on a, on a, a, uh, a stool that has three legs, like one of those legs just get, gets ripped out from under you. And so now there's like this inst instability, there's this moment of like uncertainty about how things are, are going to work from here on. And that's when new ideas, sort of new innovations that haven't had a fair chance at being brought in, uh, tried out. Um, I, I think like the sorts of like experiments that you might hope that people would be running, but nobody, they don't seem to be popular enough. In moments like that, when there's an instability, they have a shot. And similarly, things that were in the previous stability go away. Yeah. 
So a good maybe an example for that would be uh, Tesla, because usually a new car company doesn't come up uh, in the let's say in the the time frame Tesla um, has established itself. Um, I mean, I'm not uh, talking about their valuation at the market, but just the presence of the, their cars uh, and their leadership in electric vehicle and their knowledge about the batteries. And I think this has a lot of to do there with, uh, okay, now we, for example, here in Germany, we have um, uh, even more taxes on CO2, which kind of leads to higher prices for gasoline here, uh, which makes, again, it's more attractive to switch to an electric vehicle. Uh, also, the government is providing um, uh, subsidies for that. Um, so, uh, and the big uh, car makers here in Germany also are shifting right now to electric vehicles. And of course, if you have a big system of plate which is kind of tuned in for um, uh, regular uh, motors, then it's kind of hard to shift there. And you have a lot of resistance internally um, to uh, make that shift. Yeah, I think I think that is a, a very good example because that's that's exactly how it plays out. Like one one thing moves, and then the rest of the things have to move in response. And and Tyler too. That um, I'll I'll say that if you can find a way to cut down the, the length of my explanation or like attempted explanation of Kale's stuff, um, and then end with Simon's uh, discussion of Tesla, I think that would be a fabulous clip as well. Um, so this brings us to I think. The question of the day, which is, okay, if we're if we're dealing with the question of, like the there's excitement around the idea of instabilities and moments, um, there there's several questions um, at play there. Where like, how do you create instabilities, and then what do you do once those instabilities are created? And we were talking earlier about a little bit about. Um, the the new like business models that would be that maybe would make sense for for a new paradigm, and in the in the context of scarcity, we were talking about undesign a little bit, which is another thing that Cameron Tonkin Wise talks about, um, and you talked about like leasing as a as a business model instead of everyone owning everything, um, and that that reminds me of some work that Jabe and Demeji and Nafawa did around the commons. And so all that to say, like, we've got some questions. And I've, I've, before we get into the systems that you've already been describing and, and all that, I, ju I just want to point out, like, I don't know if this is going to be true or not, but I have a hunch that things that will be interesting for us to discuss later is value chain to value chain substitution and Simon's gameplay, Fool's Mate, which is all about manipulating underlying constraints or underlying dependencies. So with that, I'm gonna kind of turn it over to you, maybe to help walk us through these two kinds of models or two kinds of paradigms that you've b described both with a systems diagram and then also with a value chain. Yeah, so um, maybe um, one thought before I go into the details here is that um, I try to um, understand situations or problems from a system systematic kind of view. And um, one of the reasons uh, why I think a shift in the business model is necessary to uh, get us to more sustainability is that I think the current system in place kind of creates a situation where um, we have to produce more, we have to mm -hmm. sell more, we have to be wasteful. And um, I don't know if we can zoom in uh, on the um, left systems uh, um, uh, overview. Um, I try to get it through there. Um, so basically what, what I feel like is currently uh, at place is that a company makes, um, let's say a company who produces a washing machine or dishwashers, um, they get revenue by selling um, their machines, so units sold. Um, and of course, uh, if they have to produce new units, then their production is going up. And um, to some degree, people want to have cheap machines. So there is a tendency to create uh, low cost designs. Um, but also um, from the point of view uh, as a company, you kind of have the interest that those machines you produce are not that reliable in the end. Because um, at least if you don't 
talk about, okay, there are new people, uh, population growth or something like that, which creates new demand for new machine uh, machines. You kind of want to trigger the customer need for a new machine. And sometimes, I mean, with uh, our phones, for example, they kind of feel attractive enough for the customer to um, uh, get a new one, although the old one is working, but with, let's say, the utilities uh, we have in our home, uh, like the dishwasher or washing machine, we usually wait until it's broken. Yeah. So um, there's kind of this, the tendency uh, as a system, okay, if we have less reliability, this leads to more faulty machines. And if we have more faulty machines, we create an artificial need for customers to buy a new machine. Yep. And then we have uh, more units sold. And again, uh, as well, the problem, and, and I had, um, I think a couple of months ago, I had the issue that my washing machine broke down and my dryer broke down. And I needed also a new refrigerator uh, for my new flat here. And um, yeah, I was kind of in the pain which which kind of uh, uh, machine to buy because I wanted to buy something which is reliable enough that I can use it for years. But usually the guarantee is about two years or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to invest too much money into it because I'm not sure if I buy the, uh, the expensive one that it's really going to be more reliable. And in this kind of system here, there's no... Um, uh, let's say no attractor for the uh, producers to make them more reliable because in the end this would cost them more revenue and that's not of their interest so the system is kind of broken to produce machines that are really reliable yeah um so what i figured and this is not something which uh, i invented um I, I read some funny stories about um i think it was philips but i'm not sure if, if, if it was philips they kind of made a deal with the uh, one of the airports in the netherlands and um, they made a deal about, okay, we are um, leasing you light, we're renting you light. And the way it works is that they have a contract in place where they say, okay, um, Philips or whatever company it was, um, you have uh, to uh, provide uh, light in this uh, whole area here. And therefore we pay you um, X amount uh, in the month. And uh, what happened is was that Philips created, uh, or the company in question created uh, light bulbs in a way that they're easy to repair and that they're more reliable because now they had an interest that those uh, light bulbs were working fine and they don't have to <laughs> change them out. So I, I find this kind of funny and I thought, okay, this is a good, good story and um, why not apply that for our everyday utility uh, um, stuff we have. So. Um, I tried to, to, and this is the, uh, the right uh, um, overview, um, I tried to make an overview here. So in this case, uh, the company gets its money from the monthly fee. So basically, they want to have uh, subscribers to their service. And uh, the deal is, okay, we provide you with, for example, a dishwashing machine, and um, you pay us a monthly fee for that. And if, it's if it breaks down, then okay, we come and change it or repair it for you. And in this case, of course, um, I have the interest that I produce reliable machines and machines which are easy to repair, which in the end, if we think about our, um, our uh, resources we have on Earth is a kind of good deal because then they would try to build things um, in a way that we don't use resources again and again for new products. So this is the kind of um, starting idea I had. And of course, um, it's... I think you can imagine that it's really hard to shift an existing business from, uh, well, we are um, producing in mass scale, we have our salespeople, we have our marketing, all is uh, uh, optimized to create this kind of demand on the market for uh, new products and buying uh, new products. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, I struggled um, a lot with transferring this kind of thought into um, at, le at least a, a value chain map uh, or a value chain by Wardley. And what I came up with is the uh, graph on the um, lower left. And um, in the end, I, I found it helpful to have two users here in place. One is our average Joe, so somebody who needs a, a new uh, working dishing machine or needs a working dishwasher machine. And on the other hand, the manufacturer. Um, and the reason why I put it in here because I had to put in the viewpoint of the manufacturer into this value chain. Otherwise I had trouble explaining what's happening here and what could be changed. So maybe to, to um, get us through that uh, uh, value chain here. 
So um, the average Joe needs an, a, new, a work and dishwashing machine. And in order to get that, um, well, there needs to be a sale of this product, um, um, hopefully with competitive prices, because average Joe has an interest that the product isn't too expensive. And of course, we need the production of dishwashers. Um, if we want to have competitive prices, then we need a low cost uh, model in there which leads to cheap labor, cheap materials, um, cheap labor oftentimes in low income areas. I mean, um, we can see that that a lot of production uh, is happening, for example, in Asia or in Africa or mostly in Asia nowadays, and uh, which creates also some uh, environmental impact because we have to chip uh, uh, those things over and also create some issue on the local working market here uh, in the Western world. So from the viewpoint of the manufacturer, okay, he wants to have stable profit margins. Uh, in order to do that, okay, he has to look on the cost. So there is kind of an, an alignment with interest that they want to have low costs, so low uh, cheap uh, labor and cheap materials. Um, but they want to have uh, reoccurring uh, revenue as well. So they need to, uh, this kind of demand for new machi uh, machines. And there are a couple of ways I figured how to create demand for new machines. Of course, you can create new superior designs. But again, if we talk about utility uh, machines in our household, probably not that interesting for customers. That's how you get washing machines that sing songs to you. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't get me excited as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but um, the demand for new machines could be either triggered by, by market growth, so population growth or race and living standards in some countries, okay, but um, I grade this out because that's not the point I wanted to make here. Um, but of course, the failure rate of existing machines uh, and the high repair costs are things which kind of lead to demand for new machines. And um, you probably heard about uh, sometimes the stories, for example, uh, from Apple, where they um, kind of were um, manipulating the, the battery life or the, the performance of their iOS system. So at least it was rumored, uh, or they are really restricting people to repair those iPhones which they might have good reasons for it, but they might also want to just trigger new demand for new uh, um, iPhones as well. Um, and again, if we talk about low cost, we design things to be low cost. Um, and this might also be an, or there could be an unintended side effect that a low cost product design leads to, um, let's say a higher failure rate. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And this doesn't have to be sinister to be, Yeah problematic right like yeah. th that's like this whole it can be convenient that the result yeah. is more demand and just like it's the which the consequences the system is producing so i want to i want to explore what you view as an alternate system in a moment um i, I just want to make a note for tyler uh two things to grab i think would be like the light bulb story which was absolutely fabulous um that, that's a it's so so evocative and then also the the kind of discussing how like companies get to superior new like you, you were thinking how do how do we generate demand for new machines well superior new designs like washing machines that sing to you groan <laughs> so now looking ahead um that's our system a this is our existing yeah. kind of stability what's our system what's our alternative what's our system b so the alternative would be, or that's at least what I could imagine, is a leasing model for uh, dishwashers. Um, so again, I, I use both sides, uh, the manufacturer and the average Joe, uh, and their needs stay the, stays the same. So the manufacturer still needs some stable profit margin and the average Joe still needs to work in dishwasher machine. The average Joe here um, uh, leases a dishwasher. Um, so of course still there, needs to be some kind of production for the dis dishwasher and we will get to the details of that in, in a few minutes and there needs to be a subscription model but of course i mean this is something which is kind of a commodity or at least a product rental for nowadays so it's not problematic to create a su subscription model what will be problematic i think is a replacement and repair process so somehow if i have a trouble with my uh, dishwasher machine for example uh, i need somebody to get there uh, we all know that this kind of service could be expensive because it's labor intensive. Um, I have to cover some ground. So I don't know how this is going to uh, fan out. 
I mean, to some degree, I need this kind of service fleet for that. But if uh, those machines are easy to repair, then it might not be necessary to have a skilled worker. Uh, so from the viewpoint of the manufacturer, uh, um, they still want to have the recurring revenue. But in this case, it comes from the subscription fee. So um, what they want to have is a high retention rate of uh, leasers. So to keep those subscribers uh, intact, they still want to have some kind of low cost, but now low cost uh, comes together with a low rate of failure. Because again, if, they, if the machines break down, they have to replace it. So they have to uh, produce a new one and uh, set it up, or they have to send out somebody to repair it. Um, so this kind of changes their incentive. Um, Hence, they want to have a high quality production of those products. They want to design for reliability and easy repairs. Uh, and this funnily enough has uh, this kind of side effect that the high quality of production might uh, need skilled workers and more reliable materials, more premium materials, I don't know. Um, so this could also lead to a shift on, on where we produce things because it's, now it might be more helpful um, or better to produce it in countries where we have skilled workers um, or a better controller of the quality and we, how we should produce things, which could also be interesting from, a, um, let's say, uh, the, the government point of view um, uh, in Western countries as well. Um, yeah, and this might also lead, and you can see it down below, to uh, a reduced factory capacity because now I don't need uh, to produce that many um, uh, machines anymore. Um, I lose some kind of economy of scale factor here. Um, and this could also be one of the issues where um, some kind of resistance will take place because I have existing fa factory capacity um, and to turn it down might be problematic. So yeah, that's where I'm at right now regarding, yeah. um, let's say, the value chain for it. That makes sense. Yeah. And I th like this is this is such an interesting and, and rich problem space, and it makes me think even more that um, design away and the concept of uh, undesign that Cameron Tonkinwise talks about is like so relevant. And I, I forgot that I put together a quick reference document, basically summarizing his his paper um, and I'll put a link to that in the chat and um, for those of you who are at home uh, I'll do I'll create like a short link at lwm.events slash undesign and just so that you can find it later um, so here's this here's this paper and what and this is off to the left of your value chain but what, what Cameron kind of describes is like okay undesigning is about actually like destroying or making disappear certain kinds of designs and so when you were describing in in a different paradigm like the future paradigm the leasing paradigm all those two-year uh lived designs that they meant to actually like be replaced and mm -hmm. basically they they don't last very long because they're low cost designs because otherwise how are people going to afford them right um those low cost designs by using a leasing paradigm, you destroy all of those low-cost designs. Like you actually yeah. design them out of existence. And um, part of what Cameron kind of describes is like, okay, so you can make those designs disappear. You can uh, kind of, I, I, I'm not sure about the locked-in world part of this. So that might have more to do with this, the stability, like the in, like trying to destabilize parts of our, our world, our environment, in order to make these kinds of futures more uh, like possible. Um, and I, I like like the blanket, <laughs> if blanket annihilation is too much, consider mm. restricting use, <laughs> deploying design, design affordances in reverse. So like basically making it really annoying to use, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, probably not something you want <laughs> about your washing machine. Or dishwasher. <laughs> well, and, and maybe like part of that, uh, affordances has to do with manufacturing, like mm. what, like part of it could be arbitrary like regulation where it's like make it's really 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 painful to make designs as a company in germany for example let's say uh that are obsolete in two years like what's the penalty um and make that you know a, a disincentivized future and so anyway so furthermore he, part of what cameron describes is like you well you've got some options you can you can vilify it you can you can basically fud 
uh, fear, uncertainty, doubt, uh, talk about the dangers and the, and the destruction and all that kind of stuff. And that can work sometimes, but where that doesn't work is this is where it starts to look more like the kinds of things that we're playing with right now. So um, convergent design, introducing new products that, you know, basically destroy old, like the, the need for old products and hopefully mm. in that result in a net reduction of materials or uh, product use life extension, which is also what you're, I think, describing here. Um, yeah. Recycling, like recovering materials from, from old products is another thing. Uh, and he goes on like to, to describe a couple other ideas here, but the reason I'm mentioning all this is because I think like it starts to just give us some, some ideas, some imaginations for how to play with the value chain. And, and so to sort of finish this out on the, on the second page here, he talks about restructuring. Like, so for example, what would it be like if the city environment made it unnecessary for people to own washing machines and like that's that's a bit of a what if but like in the example um cameron uses a city can eliminate the need for umbrellas by building covered sidewalks um and lots of interesting questions i think end up being uh you can ask there but then also like sharing what if we what if we share things so yeah. this starts to like look like a vocabulary for us to think about these value chains a little bit. And let's let's dig into this a, a little bit about how to maybe find a way to destabilize this existing value chain. Because if any of the lower level things start to fail, the whole thing that's built on top of those things gets called into question as well. Yeah, and I think one thing we... Um talked about was um, the cheap materials so at least in the long run um, we can expect that cheap materials won't be anymore of course depending yep. on what kind of material we are talking about um, but this will probably be a factor which kind of makes it hard to produce uh, at low cost so i'm like thinking like oh simon's simon's got the question what are our wares you know wh where might we intervene well we could we could talk about the fact that we're running out or we could, you know, fear, uncertainty and doubt. So there's like a communications mm -hmm. campaign we could run there. Yeah. yeah. So, so cheap materials are already like, that's already going to happen. Um, and I think what's interesting is that's probably something that manufacturers know. Like, do you think they're mm -hmm. ignorant or do you think they know? Both. Okay, that's actually that's a, that's a trustworthy answer um, because yeah, it, so I, I suspect the ones that aren't ignorant are probably pretty quick to suppress mm. um, the spread of that information. I, I think there's probably another topic to to go into, but um, I think it uh, boils down to ownership of those companies. Um, because if I'm a manager of, a, let's say, a big company, which is uh, shared on the market, um, then I usually have a time span of around, I don't know, five years, something like that, where I'm head of the company or I can influence it, at least at the top level. And, well, that's my, basically my time frame. It's, it's kind of like for politicians. So sometimes I just have the time frame and then I think about, okay, do I actually want to put in now those changes? Maybe I have a contract in place which kind of gives gives me more money if the shares uh, on the market go up and then uh, I don't have the interest to make really uh, drastic changes here to my uh, existing model. I just, uh, just uh, take the next uh, good years uh, with me and then it's fine. And uh, yeah. that my successor have the troubles I didn't face. <laughs> so I think uh, this is uh, one of the problems here uh, that they know about this issue, but uh, they are hesitant to do anything about it because they're thinking in shorter time spans uh, regarding uh, yeah, yeah, their personal interest. So one of the things that I think about, it, like if you're ever, this anybody watching, like if you're ever not finding opportunities with a worthy map, you always have the option of going deeper in the dependencies. And that works regardless of whether you're looking at competitive strategy um, or whether you're just trying to make sure that your value chain that you have is going to stay operable 
Um, in our case, we're looking for vulnerable spots. We're looking for things that if you, like just like the stool analogy, like if you kick out one of those legs, like the whole thing's gonna come crumbling down. So I, I'm curious, looking at cheap materials, what, like what if we, just playing this out, right? So this is, this is another potential where it's like increase the pain. If we want it, let's just play this out as an example. If we wanted to increase the pain around the cheapness of materials, we want to find the surface area over which we could basically intervene. So what do cheap materials depend on? And again, we, we might not have like the perfect expertise for this, but like, let's, let's take some good guesses. Like what's the likely story? Mm, I think, uh, two factors. One is the um, accessibility uh, and the other one is again the cheap labor. Okay, so... Because usually you have to, um, or let's say, yeah, depending on what kind of material we are talking about, um, kind of is the cost of how we can get those materials, which is kind of related to accessibility, but also to the machi machines and uh, labor we need to, uh, for that as well. Okay, okay, that's that's a really good point. So, in order to extract cheap materials, we need the accessibility of those materials. So I'm assuming like we're using an extractive metaphor. So imagine like a mine or property or whatever that contains that. We need the cheap labor to actually do the extraction. You mentioned equipment too. Yeah. So these three things make cheap materials possible. Um, is there anything else that's that comes to mind with that? Any other things that directly enable cheap um, materials? I mean, and to some uh, relation, uh, or I see a relationship as well with the cheap labor factor um, as its own. Because um, <laughs> if I if I if I create a positive uh, future scenario, we won't have that much cheap labor in uh, specific countries because their um, level of income will, ra will, will, mm -hmm. will rise. Yeah. And if I uh, create a negative future scenario, I would say um, the climate crisis we are facing in the next years uh, will create disturbance in a lot of countries, which kind of makes the accessibility to materials, to production, to uh, cheap labor uh, even more difficult. Okay, what is it about the climate crisis that makes that more difficult? Is it literally like weather events? Yeah, for example. Okay. Um, but also, um, let's say there, I mean, it's it's going to be hard to sustain um, some countries. For example, there will be food sh uh, shortages or water shortages, which kind of leads to more conflicts. So we have some more uprisings or even um, wars between uh, countries. Um, so there could be a lot of dynamics uh, which will be created by this. Um, and again, I don't know to what degree and, and on what timeline. Yep. Um, but yeah. Okay. So, so shortages create all sorts of instability that threatens cheap labor. Yeah. And okay. also, um, another factor would be the, uh, cost of transportation might go up because, um, the re resources we need for transportation, like for example, oil, uh, for the, um, uh, tankers or the, what are they called? The, uh, container ships, um, they might go up. Okay, uh, and let's see that yeah, the availability of cheap materials does depend also on getting them to the right place. Okay, and just to sort of, so so I did something here that might be a little weird, which is I I put negative things in the value chain, mm -hmm. and like right now, <laughs> um, like if I if I wanted to like rephrase this a little bit, like it's the. I don't know if it's the suspension of I'm trying to find words here, like the absence of um, maybe, maybe avoidance of instability depends on the avoidance of shortages mm. and the avoidance of shortages depends on, let's say the, the, um, reducing, reducing the effect of climate change or, we, to be honest, we um, or without going too, into too much detail, we cannot reduce it anymore. Uh, we can try to freeze it at a level uh, which mm -hmm. is, let's say, a little bit more comfortable for us. 
as human beings, uh, but we cannot avoid it uh, totally. So um, I, w I would rather have it saying uh, um, freezing the, the effects of uh, c climate uh, crisis. Or, okay. Or however you phrase, want to phrase it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, and that's the that's the truth of it. Is like it's, it, we we had our shot. <laughs> now now we need to like, and, and I mean that goes back to what we just dis discussed earlier, where it's like we don't really pay attention to the to the moment until it's staring us right in the face. Yeah, um, that's yeah. To err is human, I guess. I mean, those effects down here are mostly things which um, will come kind of naturally to some degree and um, mm -hmm. I probably don't like to have people to have an incentive to say okay okay we have to uh, create um, more resistance against facing the climate crisis because we will profit from it <laughs> mm -hmm. so yep. maybe we can also <laughs> discover uh, or um, explore another avenue because I think um, down at the top uh, we also have an angle which might be a little bit more interesting from from a business perspective um, I haven't put it in here, but I think there's also um, the need of uh, for, for the average show to have a reliable product or to be to be sure about uh, the reliability of the product. Um, and again, this comes down to what what uh, I mentioned earlier. I, um, I was faced with the issue. I, I wanted to have a product which has a long uh, liberty to it. But uh, I was unsure about it, and um, normally they they just provide me with a guarantee of two years. Um, I think in the case I um, kind of did another uh, um, insurance uh, that it's going to have five years, so I paid something like that for that. Um, but um, if I think about cars again, uh, there are some car manufacturers like uh, Kia, for example, which give you uh, a seven-year guarantee. So ramping up the guarantee could be uh, a middle year or middle move um, to uh, kind of shift your business from production to uh, this other uh, leasing model. Mm. Um, but overall, if we think that the need of the average Joe is to, to not think about um, the product anymore and to be unsure if we should buy this product or the other one because he, he's afraid that it's going to break down in a couple of years, then this kind of leasing model is um, the best guarantee you can get. Yeah. because it's it's shifting the risk of uh, the failure of the product from the consumer to the producer and i think this is the um the, the winning argument for the customer for the customer as well okay that makes a lot of sense and so let, let's let's dig into that um because i think that's important but right before we do that um i want to just hint at something because it's a little bit devious <laughs> um looking looking lower on this value chain yeah the, the reason that i'm always like really really excited about constraints and I, I think i think we'll find like more constraints when we talk about the business model like what we're, we're going to do next but the the deeper you look the more interesting it gets and just to point out with this example if the availability of cheap materials is dependent on cheap labor equipment accessibility and cheap transport one one really horrible way of looking at this is saying, well, we should just amplify the effects of the cr climate crisis because that will yeah. cr produce all these bad effects. We don't want that, right? That that is a where that we're not going to consider. Now, at the same time, though, if I look at equipment and ask what equipment depends on, well, it depends on things like training. It depends on things like equipment vendors which might include things like export agreements or usage agreements. Um, we, you could imagine that if, for example, anyone who has training, you found a job for that was much more lucrative in a different industry. If you, if you basically ran, like imagine your business model is not sustainability of <laughs> business models, it's like, or, or, or changing to a leasing model, it's, oh, we're just gonna run a recruiting agency and all it does is just snatch up people as soon as they're trained. <laughs> and, and places them elsewhere. So creating shortages on the market. Exactly. Yeah. And if, if there's nobody to operate the equipment, then the ability for them to extract the cheap materials, it, yeah. and like that's, that's only one gambit, right? Like that's not going to be enough. But yeah. you could even have the, like... The other angle you could take is um, the political angle. Yeah. 
for example, that you say, okay, we want to create jobs here in our country uh, and to avoid the externalization of jobs to other countries. So uh, we have to yep. make some resistance <laughs> to that in place. So I don't know, some, some kind of uh, import uh, customs, uh, for example, on products which are produced in the other countries. Uh, again, this would create some side effects, which probably are not that good. <laughs> it's like... Um, do you have to be very, very careful about not like accidentally becoming a nationalist movement. But <laughs> no, but 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 I think which which is a good uh, political angle is um, to um, kind of um, make the real costs visible. Yeah, um, and that's one of the reasons why I like, for example, the CO two certificate uh, uh, movement because uh, or the, the policy because. Um, a lot of things we uh, take for granted or use in our productions aren't factored in because nobody owns it. Yep. Nobody owns the atmosphere. But uh, every time we produce something and produce CO2, we kind of take some value out of the atmosphere, uh, at least for the whole uh, human population. Yeah. But that doesn't cost anything. Only if uh, some political entity says, OK, we have to pay something for that. And I think um, thinking along these lines will create, a, let's say, a more positive uh, scenario, which also um, increases here the shift to another business model. Uh, it's such a good point. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's, I don't own the earth, <laughs> therefore, it's no problem if I destroy it. It's, it's, it's really strange. Okay. I mean, to give you to give you a good example, um, for example, in Brazil, um, they are really chopping down a lot of the uh, Amazon forest there, um, and yes, of course, somebody owns or gives out the right to to um, um, uh, let those forests be chopped if they don't do it illegally. Uh, on the other hand, nobody talks about the cost that creates for our atmosphere, uh, and it's it's not factored in. So. Um, it's kind of uh, is an economical sound do, uh, thing to do to shop the wood down and I don't know create some uh, soybeans farms. Um, but <laughs> if you would factor in what this creates, uh, 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 what kind of cost this creates in the long run, then it wouldn't be uh, that kind of interesting to do that anymore. So it's it's a problem where, as you said here, to make the real costs uh, really visible and to put it into the system. I think this is the best way forward to kind of get the change down here. Okay, awesome. So I want to get into your substitution of expectations because that's what what I expect we'll find is that that we could we could attack that problem directly and just li like work in the world of user expectations and just run user education campaigns and things along those lines. Mm -hmm. Like there are lots of moves around that, but I would bet that there's there's some stuff underneath there that isn't yet visible that we might want to take a look at like what what is it that is stabilizing the user's expectations what is it that makes the person who has to replace a refrigerator buy the cheap option when if there are other vendors out there that provide like refrigerators that should last 10 years when those options are available what it, what are those dynamics at play so Let's let's get started with with where you were pointing at with like the guarantee of so many years, the highlighted risk of a of a cheaply made piece of equipment. Let's talk through that a little bit and then see how we might get to there from here. Mm -hmm. I think to some degree it's also the issue of uh, statistics. <laughs> Uh, because I could say, okay, statistically speaking, um, your machine won't break down for, I don't know, 10 years, something like that. But uh, person on a personal level, if my machine breaks down and it's kind of the outliner, then I'm screwed anyway. So um, if I don't get the guarantee, then it's kind of useless. And I think the point here is that uh, usually the price would be an indicator for, okay, a higher price, higher quality, higher reliability. Um, but... I, I think from the consumer point of view, um, there's, I think, a lot of mistrust about that. And I think for good reason. Yeah. So, um, especially kind of with feature bloat. Playing, playing with this mistrust yeah, and, and kind of finding a way to make the consumer completely safe about that. And it's shifting yeah. the risk. Okay. In the end. Yeah. I mean, it, that makes complete sense to me. Um, getting there, though, is 
is tough. So looking at leasing a dishwasher, um, we're, we're dealing with the problem of right now we have an existing model, which is selling a dishwasher. And one of the things that Simon pays a lot of attention to is what happens on the relationship. So, so I think Simon Wardley, like thinking about, sorry, <laughs> but like think, thinking about what's happening, what's actually like being passed, what's tr being transacted across these relationships. Mm -hmm. And like, just to sort of increase the visibility of that for a moment, like I'm just gonna put some things here, like literally it's gonna be uh, low cost, like I'm paying some dollar amount and uh, let's even let's even contrast this. So selling a low cost dishwasher, let's say, low cost. Uh, what's I don't know if we're unreliable, if is the right word for this, but um, low cost unreliable dishwasher versus high cost reliable dishwasher. So we've got two, like, this is this is the current option space. One, it, it, you're transacting a little bit of money. Another, you're transacting a lot of bit of money. <laughs> um, yeah. But you're also transacting risk. Exactly. Okay, so, so let's let's get the risk kind of, it, when you think about leasing it, leasing a dishwasher, like before we get into risk, but with the, with the money being exchanged, are you paying about the same as a low cost unreliable dishwasher, or are you paying less? Um, Hard question for something that doesn't exist. <laughs> I mean, it's it, the time frame <laughs> would be, I, I think, uh, um, uh, decisive here. Um, of course, the monthly fee I pay will be lower than the uh, low cost purchase price of a, um, a dishwasher. So of course. it might be attractive for um, low income families as well because they don't have that amount of money in place. And uh, currently you can see also a lot of finance options for these kind of utility products. Um, however, of course, in the long run, um, if you would just um, multiply the monthly fee over a long a period of time, you would say, okay, it's um, more expensive than, I, than, than mm -hmm. I would buy this product. However, you have to factor in the chance of it breaking down and you have, uh, have to buy a new one. Okay, that's so really important. Ideally, in, ideally in this world, um, this kind of uh, economic um, calculation will be positive for the consumer. However, I doubt that the average Joe will do this kind of hard math <laughs> with probabilities of breaking uh, down of a product, something like that. So that makes that makes complete sense. So, so the full picture being like, if we're selling a high cost item, you have to view it as an investment. Yeah. And invest in the repair capability. Like you, you yeah. actually either need to build that capability yourself or build relationships with people who can do that for you. Yeah, and. I agree, yeah basically somehow come out the other end going, oh yeah, I'll, I'll come out ahead. That's, that's really hard to do for, for most folks. So of course, like replacing it is like the, the preferable option, but l let's talk about risk then. So are you actually like, I don't know, the way that I almost view this is that like, uh, there's more risk in doing the sustainable thing when if you mm. buy something you can repair yourself because you're not likely to actually follow through on building that repair ca capacity well I, I would say generally if i buy a product then uh, i get the ownership of the product so the risk um, is transferred to me as well the mm -hmm. risk of it breaking down or yeah. the risk that it's going to be invaluable um, in the case of leasing um, and without going into too much detail of how the contract would look like <laughs> Um, but uh, in this case, the risk uh, of uh, the, ma the machine running would still be uh, at the owner. Uh, and in this case, the owner would still be the manufacturer. Yeah, okay. And then looking back at the money again, over the long haul, the lease probably looks more expensive. 
if we don't factor in that uh, the product breaks down and I have to buy a new one. Yeah, if, if it's like, it's kind of like pretending that a data center is cheap to have. It's like nobody does the calculations on how much power it consumes. It's like, oh, there's a hidden cost there. So so actually maybe that's that's part of the perception is that like, there's, there's like a perception issue with that. So I'm not gonna like dig too much further in that, but okay. So what do you do? Like what, where do we intervene in, oh shoot, I just realized like we're, we're at time. So I should probably let you go. But like, where should we look next to dig into the possible intervention points here? Cause it seems like this relationship, I wanna know what is, I mean, or actually, I'll, I'll say this relationship. I want to know what's keeping that relationship stable. Mm. And I'm wondering, like, if there are things that you can do where... I think it's, in the end, um, the problem is if we, if we would um, follow through the, the uh, value chain here, it boils down to something like how we design products. Mm. And uh, we have to really go do deep into that and come up with a new way how to design the product. So I don't know, I build uh, parts that are easy to replace, I build parts that are reliable, um, um, and maybe I have to, uh, to, to create a completely different design to, to make that happen. Uh, and that's a really deep intervention into how I do things right now. So um, I don't know, maybe a good way to do that, but uh, would be to have uh, a kind of separate um, uh, business area. So where, where as a company, I still have my existing cheap ones maybe, but I build up new capacity uh, for um, uh, this new model, maybe flanked with a, um, with a, a high cost dishwasher um, where it kind of fits together, um, something like that. But uh, yeah, I, I'm still <laughs> struggling with imagining how this transition would look like. Yeah, that, that's that's a tough tough question. And part one of the one of the kind of things that comes to mind as you said that was like, if I were like an executive at a dishwasher company and I wanted to just kind of like recognizing that change management is hard, and mindset change is hard, and switching from we got to make everything as cheap as possible to we got to make everything as maintainable as possible is not an overnight thing and it's a it's a long extended thing what i would probably do is I, i'd want to like run an experiment like go find some customers who would be willing to to play with this idea yeah. with me and make sure that they get the financial benefits make sure that they get they get the the lowered risk and that they're aware of that but then put one of our existing dishwashers in there just one of the cheap ones. Yep. Just try the leasing model out and see if somebody bites. Yep. And then start feeling the pain. Like yep. as it starts to break, as it starts to, to hurt, and as the service calls come in, like start basically exercising all the pathways of what it would take to actually make this model work. And then eventually it's going to be like, hey, so it seems like people really like this model, mm -hmm. but it's not financially sustainable on our end because we just build the cheapest thing possible. Yeah. And I, I think- And then you could pinpoint the, the pain points, yeah. And I, I think it's great to think about it as an experiment because I think you can do that um, uh, locally as well. So if you have some uh, repairing or manufacturing cap capabilities somewhere near, you could say, okay, in that area, we offer this uh, leasing model and I don't know, put some ads into a, a local magazine or something like that. Um, and then see who, who bites and uh, you have at least some accessibility to people um, delivering the machines, getting them out, repairing them. Uh, but of course, you also need some kind of scale to it because there's, let's say, a chance of them failing or not failing. Uh, and uh, you also have to think about a little bit of longer time frame to that experiment because yeah. Even if we talk about um, two years, it's still two years, yeah. Until <laughs> yeah. maybe some machines fail. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely true. I feel like there's there's even more there that we would need to be explored and and described and designed. I mean, I don't think that it's hopeless. I mean, it, it really seems like if there was someone with with a um with like the vision of of what that could look like, and at least the willingness to sort of 
see how that might turn into a win-win for the organization and for like the greater good, right? Like obviously that the greater good is, is important, but sometimes it's, sometimes I cheat and I just appeal to the, the, the usefulness of, yeah. of doing the, the right thing. Like, so that there's something there to explore for sure. But you, but you know what I, what I often say to um, some of my clients is yeah. um, when they uh, identify a real problem or let's say a real pain point or a real hard um, hurdle to, to uh, get over, that's a good sign. Because let's imagine um, some company out there is going in that direction right now. And we just uh, scratched at the surface that it's taking some time to shift to that model. And they're starting this transition right now. And as, as they go along, the pain we described down there with the resources and labors and everything uh, is starting to amount. They are in a really, really good spot to uh, get uh, big market shares in the future because the other competitors will have the same pain to transfer or transition from their model to the other one. So starting now, uh, anticipating the change, which will most likely happen, um, is a good investment. Uh, but of course, it has to be done uh, in the right manner. Oh, that's such a good point. And that's the perfect place for us to close today. Yeah, and I'm going to just mention this. Hey, Tyler, grab that, because that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> Simon, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And Thank you, Ben, for having me uh, again. Th this was uh, it just tickles the parts in my brain that make me want to like go off and 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 just explore value chains for hours on end um so thanks for bringing this to us thanks for spending your time with us and i mean i mean in the end we need people uh, as you to to work on those kind of things that's i think it's important yeah hey you hear that everybody out there that's you too <laughs> yeah so like let's let's make maps let's look at value chains let's explore the vulnerabilities of these existing problematic ways that things are um and try to find those edges and just see if we can explore them a little bit to make things better so with that thank you simon for being here thanks everyone who's watching it now and also yeah. later um i appreciate you and i guess uh go make some apps we'll, we'll see you later <laughs> bye. bye everyone